Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you may be across the world. Thanks so much for joining us live here today for Serverless Office Hours. And we're streaming live on AWS Twitch channel and on the Serverless Land YouTube channel and also newly on LinkedIn. So if you are joining us from LinkedIn, that's one of our new channels. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Julian Wood and I'm a developer advocate for the Serverless team at AWS. And this week, I'm super happy to be joined by Sarah Gerian, who's a senior solutions architect, and Andrea Amorossi, who's a partner solutions architect. And even happier to say that we may be an American company, but we're all European based today. Um, Sarah and Andrea are both Italian, but they don't live in Italy. So Sarah, how are you today? Hey, thanks a lot for the introduction, Julian. I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I'm very, I'm, I'm very good. So you, you are Italian, but you are based in Amsterdam. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I've been living here for a few years. Um, yeah, I come from the northeast of Italy originally, and I moved here uh, as part of my career. And yeah, uh, happily living here. Oh, cool. Support. Excellent. And Andre, you're also Italian, but living in Barcelona. So, I mean, correct. Yes. I'm not liking Italy or something going on. I don't want to no, put, no, put words I, in I, your mouth. I really, I really like it. It's just, you know, I came here in Barcelona a few years ago to study and then, you know, I like the, the weather, the people, and I decided to stay. Excellent. Nobody can argue with the tapas in Barcelona at all. So that is great. And uh, Sarah's got a really cool title, which I like. She's a digital native solutions architect. So when someone says, what do you do at work? I'm a digital native. I think that is awesome. But yeah, you've been at AWS for, I think, a year and a half, which in, yes. in, in normal years is, I don't know if it's like dog years or something, but it's about 700. <laughs> yeah. So I was saying also before, before going live that to me, it feels like yesterday and a decade ago at the same time. It's, it's a very, in a good sense, in a good sense. Um, not only because, of course, the pandemic, but also, I mean, it's a very... Uh, it's a very interesting company to work for, and I'm very, very happy. Ah, oh, cool. Excellent. Well, it's super great to have you. And basically, this week, we are going to be talking all about... Um, oh, sorry. I was silly. I didn't bring that up. So that's, uh, no way, that, that's no Sarah way. and Andrea's uh, contact details. I'm really having more, more more fun talking to you than um, paying attention to what I should be showing. But um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pop this up at the, at the end so you can uh, follow these two great experts uh, on Twitter. But yeah, just looking back over the past week um, uh, in the world of AWS and the world of serverless, last week we had a fun episode. It was all about uh, looking back at AWS reInvent and we had one of the sort of top software architects from Liberty IT, uh, Liberty Mutual IT, um, Christy Peralt, who was talking. And yeah, she went through a lot of her sessions and I went through a whole bunch stuff that was happening at, uh, at reInvent, that little sort of small conference of 20,000 people um, um, yeah, across in Las Vegas. So yeah, that was super fun. Super fun. So if you want a, a recap of everything that was happening at reInvent over the past year, uh, that was the place to look at. Um, yeah, just to keep you up to date, there were a whole lot of breakout sessions that were at reInvent all al along the serverless track and also uh, event-driven applications. And so yeah, this QR code you can use there. Those are all the kind of sessions. You know, there's a vast amount of information uh, over there. Uh, that QR code links to the YouTube playlist. So this is everything to do with serverless. And then also you can branch out and, and look at some of the other playlists, which will have information on some of the other tracks as well. Serverless Office Hours, we were there live, actually in reInvent every single day, which was great fun. We spoke to some serverless heroes about the cool projects they're working on. We talked about Serverless Espresso, which is a great demo we had um, um, in the in the Dev Lounge in um, in Las Vegas. And I have to say, we even had some Italians come up and say that the coffee was really good. So that was, I wow. think, was a vote of confidence <laughs> for the coffee this is that like we managed to get in Vegas. Warranty of quality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So a seal of approval from um, from Italians is always a good thing. And yeah, it was really fun also to listen to David Richardson, and he's the vice president of all serverless at AWS. So he's got he had some great wisdom. So yeah, that's a YouTube playlist for that, and it's really uh, fun to sort of see what was going on at uh, at reInvent. And then there's also a post that came out at the end of the last year. Um, every quarter we have an in case you missed it blog post that comes out, which just highlights everything that's been going on. And obviously with the lead up to reInvent, there's a huge amount that's going on. So this post really covers a whole bunch of stuff going on in the serverless space and you know uh, links to videos and learning paths and any other kind of things that are going on so it's an easy quick stop shop to uh, to get yourself up to date 
Then looking just back over the, the past week, obviously it's a ramp up into the new year. And just after reInvent, I think some of the product teams are make, maybe having a bit of a line in the morning, uh, but not all of them because there's still some loads of things going on. Two from Lambda. Um, Lambda now supports IPv6 endpoints for inbound connections. So if IPv6 is something your network team is, is asking about, well, this is now available for Lambda. And then also a big thing if you're a Node.js developer, Lambda now supports ES modules and top level await for Node.js 14. So this has always been something that's been a bit sort of tricky, I think, to understand how um, how the top level wait works for Node.js, where you did things in the cold start, and then it didn't only happen in the cold start, and then it was all a bit sort of confusing. So, I mean, I don't know, uh, Sara and Ari, are you Node developers at all? Have you played with this at all? Not to put you on the spot. So I, I used to be, a uh, fun fact, before working for AWS, I used to be an AWS customer myself. And I used to actually, yeah, build the uh, Node.js uh, applications. I was both for Lambdas and also an ECS, for instance. Okay, yeah. And I I can imagine, uh, like, I remember when I was a customer myself, I it's a nice thing to have. And it, I, it, it increases, it helps the developer experience, in my opinion, yeah. for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So happy for the team. Yeah. Yeah, Andre, you were gonna so, say. So yeah, it also contributes to lower costs. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, the lambdas will last less because uh, some code can ex be executed in the cold start function. Yeah, and I, I like the because it's always the way Lambda is meant to work, that you write code in the cold start and it runs only in the cold start and you're sort of 100% guaranteed that that's not going to bleed over into the first invocation. And because of the way Node uh, 14 worked, there was always this, ah, uh, well, you weren't quite sure what was going to happen. So yeah, really happy that the, the team have worked hard uh, to put this out. Yes. So yeah, if, you, if you're interested in that, there's a blog post, I'll just highlight to that. Uh, yeah, there is an amazing blog post that I read. Uh, I really recommend it. Yeah, I'll, I have a link to that as well. So yes. I'm glad you liked it. And then also this SNS one, is is interesting not just for the sake of sns but this is all about attribute based access controls so we've got role based access controls and i know a lot of aws service teams are now starting to also roll out attribute based access controls where you can basically give access based on tags so this is something i think uh, service teams are really cool and this is just another whole way that you can actually make far simpler iron policies because you can target tags rather than having to create separate policies and this is for sns so if sns needs to send to a whole bunch of different targets you can tag those targets and then that will give you the permissions for sns so yeah really interesting way to be able to do more effective permissioning with uh, sns so yeah that we've covered some of these blog posts already in case you missed it and uh, and dan fox who's a uh, super clever and writes really well for the nodes modules um but yeah, two different other things. This three-part series, the building a serverless multiplayer game that scales. So if you are doing serverless and you want to scale, um, Tim, Chelsea, and Brian have really uh, some good information on using a multiplayer game, but obviously this is applicable to a lot of other workloads. And then yeah, uh, Matthew Nightingale did a good bl uh, blog post as well, which is, you know, Lambda is really good for connecting different services together. And so this is using Amazon location services and how to validate addresses. So that was really cool. But today we are have the experts. We have Sarah and Andrea, and we today we are talking about uh, AWS Lambda Power Tools. So, as an intro, Sarah, what is Lambda Power Tools? So, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, yeah, so uh, first of all, I'm assuming some of you might be familiar with the library, but some of you might not. So, if you already know or are familiar, please forgive uh, forgive my introduction. I just want to make sure that everybody who is attending has an understanding of the library. And before I start diving deep into the library, I just want to uh, take a step back and talk about something that I I talk uh, also very often with my my customers and AWS does uh, and other AWS solution architects do. Um, and I want to do that by uh, speaking first about our well-architected framework. So we have a well-architected framework, and in particular, the uh, serverless lens, where we suggest to developers and AWS customers a number of best practices that are related to operational excellence. And when I mean, when I say operational excellence, what I mean, it's a pillar that includes, among other things, the ability to support development and run workloads in an effective way. And in a way in which you as developer can gain insight into your own operations and be in control of it. And uh, 
I don't, I don't know if solutions architect should be really be uh, biased towards uh, certain pillars. This is my own favorite pillar uh, together with reliability. But yeah, so this is uh, this is something that I really have dear in this because um, to be able to really deliver business value fast and with confidence, the teams of developers need to have a shared understand understanding of what are the workloads they own and what are the expected behavior. This is super important, and this is something that I found that I found important even when I was a developer myself. When I was on call for those services, it's it's something that really increases the confidence and also the speed of delivery. No, being able to understand what's going on, which might sound like a given, but it might it's not as easy sometimes so coming back to the operational excellence we have a prefer phase in which we we ask to our customers so how do you design your workload so that you can understand its state or an operate phase in which we ask uh, so how do you understand the health of your workload and as in order to do that among the different things um what developers can do is to implement and configure telemetry, which can be related to their application, to their workload, dependencies and user activity. And what do I meet, mean with telemetry? It means um, um, I can be API calls, HTTP status code, events, uh, information about what's going on within your code, um, uh, business events, and so on. Um, so you need to have that, that information that is necessary for you to understand what is the internal state. And some of the ways you can do to, you can, um, uh, you can uh, um, leverage to achieve this is through data points, data types like metrics, logs, and traces. And that will ring a bell, most likely. And why do you need that is because you need to reduce you can reduce defects ease remediation improve the flow into production i speak also for personal experience mitigate the deployment risks you know that you're ready to support a workload you can make informed decisions to deploy systems and the related changes and my own personal opinion is that when you do that it's also good it's a win for everybody involved uh, developers, uh, product manager, engineering manager, everybody is happy when you know what's going on and you feel in control and you feel that you have confidence about your workload. So now that I did this introduction, uh, uh, I will kind, kindly introduce the AWS Lambda Power Tools library. So what is Sorry, it? Just, be just before you do, I, I yeah. really want to highlight to people watching the sort of importance of well-architected. and. People, yes, sometimes, people sometimes look at it and they go, oh, it's a well-architected framework, and they sort of understand that, but what does it mean to be well-architected? And I know it's sometimes a, a word people don't understand, and it's basically a whole bunch of best practices that a lot of clever people at AWS have put together over many years, and they've built uh, codified these best practices into a well-architected framework, which is a whole bunch of questions that you can ask, and you can self-certify your own applications from however small they're building them to how big you're building them, ideally as early as possible to really uh, to do the right thing, to have best practices yeah. built into your applications. And it is super useful. Um, I mean, I, in fact, it's so near and dear to my heart. I've done a, you know, a whole blog series on going through all of the pillars of the Well Architect framework and trying to help you understand how to uh, apply it to security to API gateway or you know, operational excellence, as, uh, as Sarah is talking about, to be able to gather the metrics, logs, and traces. So. Yeah, I really suggest it's worth taking your time to read about well architected. And if you're not quite sure what the term well architected means, it's basically best practices, and it covers you know security, reliability, and performance, and cost. And I can't believe I can't remember the other two off the top of my head. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, huge bunch, huge bunch of information. So sorry, I just yeah, I didn't want to just leave you there. I think, no, no, you know, I, actually, gonna, thank you, this. thank it's you. Awesome. And Absolutely, the cool thing is, thank you. you've got even you know clever people who are now uh, codifying this in software as a tool, which we're now going to talk about power, um, power tools. So yeah, yep. I, I had my ramble. No, 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 that was great. Actually, thanks for uh, actually diving deep a bit on the well architected framework because it's it's really useful. It's really as a customer when I was a developer, I really was reading it myself because I I, I think it's very insightful and also. My personal take on this is that it also speaks about best practices 
uh, in general. It's it's really interesting. Uh, if you're building a cloud, you should you should read it. So that being said, uh, coming back to the AWS Lambda Power Tools library. So what is it? It's a library that was launched by our principal solutions architect, Heitor Lessa. Um, Can I just I say I... that Heitor Lessa is one of my favorite people in the entire mm. world. And he was living in London, he now lives in Amsterdam. And I got to meet him you know, a number of times before he moved. And just the amount of knowledge that's swimming around in his, yes. his brain yes. is just incredible. And he's just an effervescent, lovely human being. Uh, so Absolutely. the fact that Heitor started this is is it just adds even better credence to this cool tool. <laughs> yes, it's great. And uh, you might be surprised it's not Italian, given statistically the number of Italians in this conversation is Brazilian. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, so what he did, he launched the, um, the AWS Lambda Power Tools library in the first half of 2020. So that was a bit ago, and it was written in Python. And the idea was inspired by the Zone Lambda Power Tools that was written in, in uh, JavaScript by the absolutely amazing people at the Zone and their their uh, then principal Jan Trey that uh, he used to be a principal back and we used to be colleagues by the way, as well. So uh, that was the the idea that inspired the Python Power Tools, and. Um, it's also good to clarify that this library was ideated, written, and owned by volunteers in AWS. And this is all created with the help, the help of the AWS community. So everything that we produce is part of like a solutions architect. Um, to uh, it was done in our as as volunteer um, effort to bring value to customers and uh, developers uh, that uh, that we need it. And so right now we have a Python Power Tools, we have a JavaScript Power Tools, and recently uh, we launched um, a Power Tools written in TypeScript. And Andrea and myself are part of this team. And uh, um, yep, yeah, so um, the idea, so we have, uh, we have a number, we have, um, so the idea behind this is that we need to help customers and developers really adopting best practice in, in a way that it's easy. So I, I also saw from my own past experience that sometimes it's it's hard. So for, first of all, um, when you approach operational excellence or uh, observability in general, sometimes it's easy to get lost and to not really know what's the best way to do things, especially even if you know already the concept. So how is it in practice? So what the AWS Lambda Power Tools does for you is that it, um, it helps you ad adopting those uh, adopt the, those best practices. Uh, for instance, in the case of metric traces, um, um, uh, uh, the logs as well. We the Python one has a number of other utilities that are not yet in uh, in the TypeScript one, but uh, we um, we plan for future future parity in the future. But long story short, it's it's something that should bring value in terms of adoption of best practices, but also speed of development. Because what I also noticed myself when I was a developer, it takes really some time to write always the same code. Uh, so if you are part of the team, you notice that there are things that repeat themselves, like instrumenting your Lambda with logs, metrics, or traces, uh, sometimes doing hidden potency, um, um, yeah, hand handling the events that are incoming. So this really should take away the operational burden from you so you can focus on the business value. Uh, Andrea or Julian, anything that you would like to add? Andre, you first, please. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sarah. That was like a very, very comprehensive introduction. But yeah, I mean, I think the message that we want to convey with this uh, with this tool is that we want to try to reduce boilerplate code and try to make developers' life easy and allow them to really focus on what's important for them, not necessarily instrumenting your functions and making them excellent in terms of operation, but focusing on their logic. And this is where Power Tools aims at helping. And for us, it's uh, as you might have been understanding from how we're speaking, it's really like a, a work of passion. We really care about those topics, and we're doing this because we are interested and we want to offer a better experience to developers and customers. 
Yeah, and this is yeah. definitely, I know, uh, you know, internally and externally, this has very much been driven by uh, customer need and literally people writing Lambda functions going, wouldn't it be nice to have X utility? And, you know, that obviously started with Python. I In the chat, I have put links to uh -huh. the Python, uh, Java, and the, the TypeScript versions, uh, but that's the Python one. I did have the Java one. So there was a question about whether PowerTools is available for Java. Yes, it is. And that's the one over there. And then um, that's the link for TypeScript. Um, it, it is in the yeah. chat as well, so you'll be able to follow. Um, so the three, three utilities for the logging, metrics, tracing, and I think also there's an event handler is in all three. So that's uh, that's by default. Python is, has a whole bunch of additional uh, utilities. But I think it's just worth calling out that the, the TypeScript one is not quite production ready. It's only literally yeah. come out a, a week ago or so ago. Yes. So yes, yeah, Sarah, do you just want to expand on, on, on the reason for yeah. that? Sorry, I was also too dis distracted by the chat because I saw some people sh uh, giving, uh, saying um, a very nice comment about the power tools. Thank you so much. I think it means so much for us that uh, this is bringing you value. This is the whole point of uh, doing it. So thanks for the kind words for the people in the chat. Thank you, Steve. Uh, but uh, coming back, uh, coming back for your question. So. Um, it is true. So we released the TypeScript Power Tool now as a beta developer preview. It's not production ready, so please do not use it in production. <laughs> we have also our all alerts because I want, to, like, we want to make be transparent that uh, it's still uh, uh, being in development. So we're still building some uh, uh, some feature around it uh, right now. Um, I think our team, the TypeScript team, um, uh, definitely is gonna. It's planning to make it production ready over the next months. We don't have a time for when it's going to be. It depends, as always, it depends. It depends on uh, uh, the feedback that we get from the community, which is one of the reasons why we made it public before being production ready, because we really want to know, is this is this something that brings brings value to you? How is the developer experience? How is this, um, uh, this particular feature? Is it working well for you? So we really are keen to hear from the community, and it's very important from us. Um, on uh, another side, another aspect is that we are um, we would love to automate tests as much as possible. We are now working on writing end-to-end -end tests for our libraries on top of unit tests that are very already existing. We want to do some benchmarkings and performance tests because we want your Lambda to be as performance as possible with our libraries. So there are a couple of things on the pipeline to make it production ready, plus all the nice PRs that our community already open. And uh, yeah, so this is the this is the situation. Cool. Yeah, just quickly before we do get into just uh, actually having a look at it, which I'm sure people would love to, is what was it just uh, Alpha Codes? Uh, thanks for joining us again. Yeah, uh, I mean, JavaScript, obviously, TypeScript is, you know, related. You know, what was the yep. thought of doing TypeScript rather than JavaScript, for example? So the idea is that um, I find the idea of working with types, uh, it increases. I, c I can speak personally about it. Uh, like I think working, I, I am familiar with JavaScript as well, and I don't mind working with JavaScript, but there is a level of confidence when you work with types that it makes, uh, it makes you feel like your code is more robust and you have a, a better idea of what are the outputs of your code and your functions and your methods. And, um, I, what I love, allow, uh, what I love about TypeScript is that it's also a lot, many times, um, self-explanatory in terms of documenting these types and uh, making it easy to understand um, what is going on. Um, you can use you if you use a, a, a JavaScript. So you don't have to use TypeScript to code your lambdas in TypeScript to use it. As long as you use a Node.js runtime that you can you can still use it because at the end the our TypeScript code will compile into JavaScript and then it's gonna be available to you. Um, you're gonna have the developer experience of types as well if you use TypeScript in your in your in your Lambda functions, but uh, that's about it. Yeah. Oh perfect. So that's yeah that's really good to know that TypeScript being a sort of superset of JavaScript, if you yes. you can still use this for you can still use the TypeScript for uh, power yeah. tools within your existing JavaScript applications. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, our packages are published on NPM, so they are, as Sarah said, they are transpiled. So you can just use them in your Node.js functions, and uh, you can take advantage of the auto completion in your IDE. And this is actually goes at the heart of what of 
TypeScript and our tenants, we are not asking you or we're not expecting you to go and rewrite all your lambdas to take advantage of the tool or TypeScript. Uh, you can incrementally adopt the tool, start with JavaScript, just import the library, use them. And then if you feel comfortable with TypeScript, then go for it. And you don't have to change a lot in terms of logic. Yep. So something that I wanted to add, Julian, uh, just to clarify. So the three TypeScript utilities that are out are the logger that emits logs, the traces, the tracer that emits traces, the metrics that emits uh, metrics. There is also an event handler, which is part of the core utility in Python, which is going to be part of our roadmap in the future. But let's say that for now, for our production ready release, we are focusing on making these three um, production ready, as much production ready as possible. So then uh, we can focus more after that on other utilities. Because I think uh, one of the things that I didn't mention, but it's part of the, a beta release, is that uh, there, there can be um, some significant breaking changes in the future. So we're still also kind of fine tuning. Uh, fine tuning the, the developer experience, the contracts, um, the parameters. So that's still all work in progress. A Perfect. demo, yes. I think, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Rahul, you're prompting me as well. I think all of us <laughs> are itching. Let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's see Lambda Power Tools. Sure. All right. Let's go for it. So I will, uh, will be sharing my screen. So, uh, here we basically me and Sarah we are going to show you a lambda function that uses uh, power tools uh, with all the utilities that we have released so far. The lambda function that's not focused too much on the logic itself done or the function, but we want to show you how to use uh, power tools. So obviously uh, the first things to to do in the function would be to import all the different packages uh, that you can download, as I mentioned earlier, from npm. And then in this specific uh, case, we are using something that uh, it's called MIDI middleware. So Sarah, you're really, really experienced on this. Do you want to maybe tell us about it a bit more? So MIDI middleware is just uh, is a library that is very popular in the um, AWS ecosystem when it comes to um, Lambda function. And it's already an established um, uh, library. And what it does, it provides um, an easy to use middleware logic that you can quote unquote plug and play before um, and after the execution of the Lambda handler. And you can do a number of things uh, in this middle middleware, uh, using this middle middleware, because there is a number of, there is always a, a, often a business logic that you want to do before the handler uh, logic starts and after the handler logic is executed, like for instance, like flashing your metrics or, um, um, uh, parsing errors that you might need to format in a specific way if they are thrown in the within the handler. But to come back to how what how is that integrated with the AWS Lambda Power Tools TypeScript, MIDI middlewares is just one way in which you can integrate our AWS Lambda Power Tools uh, library into your code. So you can do that by manually calling the methods of your logger or tracer or metrics instance, or you can use media middlewares that keep your code a bit more cleaner and more neat and allows you to do a set of operations without you having to do them. Um, or you can use decorators. And this is something that within TypeScript, you can do if you encapsulate your handler in a Lambda class, for instance. So this is not part of this demo, but this is an option. And what essentially, it allows you to do essentially the same. So perform operations before or after your handler logic is executed from within your uh, Lambda code, Lambda function code. And this is something that was, um, uh, so using decorators is not maybe the most common pattern used by a Node.js developer, but it's something very um, uh, loved by Python developers who might come from the Lambda Power Tools uh, Python library. And yeah, that's also an option. So in this uh, demo that uh, Andrea is showing, we're using MIDI, 
And yeah, please go ahead. Yes. So uh, the first thing that we that we want to do is uh, basically create a service name and a namespace. So a service name is uh, a key, an entity, a string that you will be using to slice and dice your metrics, your logs, and your traces. And this is something that we it's you will see throughout all the different utilities. So uh, at first, we obviously need to uh, instantiate all our classes. In this case, we're instantiating metrics, logger, and traces. We're passing different the, the two parameters that I just mentioned, like namespace and service name, space name, plus also other parameters specific to to the loggers. Now, as you will see in the documentation, if you go check check it out, there are several. There are, there is a number of way of passing those parameters. Here, I'm just showing. Uh, one by passing the parameters, but you can also, for, for example, set them in the environment uh, environment variables of your Lambda function, or you can also uh, pass them through the configuration of the middlewares, as you will see below. And then we go uh, in the first, uh, let's say, utility part of the tracer. So in this specific Lambda function, we are making a call using uh, the AWS SDK. Uh, for, just for demo purposes, I'm calling the STS service. And here, I just wanted to showcase uh, how Tracer can help you to capture all the API calls that are made to a specific AWS service to generate segments for those calls so that you will be able, and you'll see later in the X-Ray console, to basically say, see and understand what is the impact of those uh, API calls on the on your function uh, duration. So, um, in in the specific uh, in, in the implementation of the Lambda handler, maybe we start with the with the logger. Here we have basically uh, several features that are already made uh, for you. Several calls that are made made for you. One of those is the injection of the context. Sarah, do you want to tell us more about it? Yeah, so something that it's very can be very useful and it's it's there if you enable it. So um, it's the um, adding some useful context about the uh, information about the context of your Lambda function invocation. So information that might be this this information might be related to is this a cold start or not? What is the function name? What is the function um, ARN? So this can be something that might or might not be helpful. And it, instead of having to write your code all the time and having to instrument your lambdas manually, you by using MIDI middleware, you literally have to write one line of code, which is, I think, at the bottom of this file. You just have to say, uh, inject lambda context. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's literally the line that you have to do. And then all your logs, we're going to have information, useful information about, um, yeah, the context of the lambda. And yeah, so this is uh, this is about the Lambda context. So that's literally just adding one line to say, you know, log out the Lambda context. You know what I mean? Yeah. Rebuild that whole object and then log it out. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and, and this basically helps you contextualize uh, your your logs basically because you know it adds uh, uh, several other information regarding the context, the function, like the function I ARN, the, the runtime, yeah. the duration, the, the name. And then we can also add other log attributes that will be uh, that we call persistent log attributes, which are basically key value pairs that, are, that get added to all the, the logs together with the uh, message that you specify. In this case, in this case here, we're showing that we can generate different logs at different levels. Uh, obviously, uh, you will be setting a log level uh, for your application. And uh, depending on the log level, some of those messages will be logged out and some other. And then we have also another interesting feature, which is the sample rate value, which basically, in order to save cost, uh, allows you to basically sample some of your logs. So Sarah, do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, so the sample rate value is essentially, um, it's a utility that is allowing you to both save costs and so keep the cost of your AW, the AWS produced logs down, but also on the same time be, um, be 
uh, aware of some of the operational logs that are running on production. So what do I mean for that? So what developers typically do is that maybe when you have your Lambda function running on a developer environment or a developer um, AWS account, you may want to have log level either info or debug. And again, this is an example, it depends on the case, but this is what typically happens because you, when you deploy in your development environment, you want to have all the logs and you want to really have um, a clear understanding of what's going on, whether in, if you want to deploy on production, um, sometimes it's not a good idea to have all the logs enabled because of data pollution. That's just too much information that you might not need. And also at the same time, you might you you don't need those logs and they actually have an impact on on the costs of your of your AWS account so what you might do uh, on production for example is to set a log level like um uh, error or warn that logs only the logs items that have a le log level warn or error uh, but at the same time you still might want to have some idea of the other operational logs, but you don't want to log all of them. You just may want to log a small percentage of all the invocations that you have. So then you have, um, when you deploy, because sometimes when you deploy, you have also the idea, okay, I deployed, I wanna see in the logs if things are working the way they expected. And by looking at the logs and see that you have a small percentage of logs that are going through, even including the operational, more operational one, the positive one, then it, that's also increases your confidence as a developer that things are, are working. Because imagine when you deploy and you don't see anything, no logs, sometimes it can be, it can be a bit, it can be a bit uh, um, scary because I don't see any logs. Is this a good thing or it's a bad thing? It might be that there are no errors, but I don't really know, you know? So this is also good. I think for for a developer and also things that I patterns that I see other custom many customers um, adopting. Thank you, Sarah. So, yeah. So so yeah. Moving on with the with the with the features, uh, we go into metrics. So metrics is a utility that allows you to emit metrics into basically CloudWatch metrics. Uh, using the middleware, like in this demo or the decorator pattern. Uh, metrics will do a number of things for you. It will allow, it will limit default metrics. It will create a metric for all your functions that uh, have a cold start. And also will enforce some rules, like for example, uh, throwing if some uh, throwing an error in case uh, no metrics have been emitted. And this is uh, this is th those metrics that you emit are custom metrics, obviously. And they uh, sit on top of the default metrics that Lambda already uh, emits by itself, like the duration, the invocations, the errors, and so on. Now, in this case, uh, we just wanted to showcase different methods. Uh, you can add uh, custom metrics, so you can give them names. We also offer um, some different kinds of uh, types and units for your metrics so that you don't have to uh, guess or come up with them. You can just import the package and uh, use them. And obviously, you can specify values. Uh, you can also set different dimensions, uh, specify some metrics uh, on top of the different dimensions, and then basically mix uh, the two. And those are later we'll see how they look in the in the CloudWatch uh, console. You can specify in integers, percentages, and so on. Yeah, I mean, just to say also, yeah. you know, all, all of these metrics is using the embedded metrics format. So it's asynchronous. It means it's faster, it's cheaper, yeah. it's way simpler. So if you have been using the put metrics API call, yeah, time to time to move over to the embedded metrics format, and obviously Power Tools is going to make that much easier. Yeah, let yeah. me let me also clarify this one. Uh, sorry, Andrea, just to 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 clarify this one is that when you 
and thanks Julian for for mentioning this. So when you do the HTTP API call, so when you use the SDK directly to do HTTP calls under the hood, so you are actually increasing the latency of your Lambda function because you're blocking the execution, you're waiting for the 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 response and so on. Whether when you use uh, the embedded matrix format, what you're doing, you're printing to standard output. So that doesn't have an impact on your late. So it doesn't have as big impact on your latency. It's just printing and then you can integrate uh, it. It, it inc integrates out of the box with CloudWatch. So there is literally nothing else that you have to do. It's just um, it's just easy. So that's something that I would recommend uh, in this case. Yes, yeah. and it's also sort of, I call it the sort of powerful two for one, because although you are creating metrics, you are actually just logging something in a structured JSON log. Yes. And CloudWatch Metrics is pulling the metrics automatically out of the logs, and then you can actually go and discard those logs. So you can actually, you probably need the, you may need the logs for other purposes, uh, but yeah, you're not actually in effect doing it. That's why I say it's a two for one. You sort of getting metrics and your logs just for creating your logs. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yes. So, and the last one of the three utilities uh, is uh, Tracer. So, uh, Tracer works in conjunction with X-Ray. So, in order for your traces to be registered, uh, you need to active you need to activate uh, active sampling uh, in your Lambda configurations. And once that this is done, you need to instrument your function. So, basically. Uh, Lambda, when uh, X-ray and tracing are activated, already generates some uh, segments uh, in your traces. So you will you will see in your X-ray console uh, a phase for the buildup of for the initialization of the Lambda, another for the invocation, and so on. What uh, Tracer from Power Tools helps you do is to basically create easily uh, segments and subsegments, annotations, a metadata. Uh, to better understand the flow or, and uh, the performances of your application. So in this uh, in in this in this case, Tracer uh, will do for you. Uh, will add a call call start annotation on the main segment, so that later on you can basically go in the X-ray console, apply uh, group filters, and you can understand what are what were the, the functions that had a call start or not. The same with the service, so that basically you can better slice and dice uh, your functions and your services. And then it also uh, automatically adds and captures uh, both the response of, uh, of your Lambda function and, uh, interestingly enough, also captures the errors and the stack traces of your function, if there are any, as metadata on your on your trace, so that later on you can go in your service map and see if a function was uh, through an error. You can go and see uh, what happened, uh, not just from the logs but also from the trace itself, so that you can have a better view. So in this uh, in this example, uh, we are basically creating a new subsegment. Uh, we are adding some uh, some notations to it. Uh, here, as you can see, I'm just doing a regular. Uh, SDK, AWS SDK call, and I, and I want to call the attention to the fact that we're not doing anything special and specific to Power Tools here, but now in, in a minute you'll see the how this is reflected in the traces. And here at the end, uh, what Sarah was mentioning earlier, we're basically wrapping your uh, our Lambda handler with uh, MIDI. And then we're using uh, some of the middlewares, which are the middlewares brought by, by power tools and uh, we are using them in a specific order which will be evaluated by midi and follow a specific life cycle so uh, i don't know julian do you have any questions so far no i think that's good it's yeah it's nice to see the code where this is all going to generate stuff and i'm i'm confident you're going to have some time to show us what it looks like in the <laughs> yes <laughs> that's what i'm going to do now so now I'm just gonna. I already have deployed this uh, this function uh, with deployed with CDK. And by the way, it's one of the examples that you can find in our repository. So later on, you can go just and check it. And uh, yes, so I just uh, executed it. Let me maybe run it once again. And now we can already go uh, while the console logs. We can already see here uh, that. A uh, service map was generated. So let me make it a uh, bit bigger. 
So we can see already that basically uh, the lambda function was executed. Uh, there are we're going to see the traces, and there is also a call to SDS. So this is the view that you will see uh, in X-ray. So we start with X-ray, and we're going to see also the logs and the metrics later. So with just a few lines of instrumentation of your function, you can see that basically uh, Power Tools had a different segment, subsegment. It captured the API calls to the to the AWS SDK uh, SDS, and for each segment, uh, for instance, we capture things like uh, the call start. If, so whether this specific execution was a call start, uh, the name of the service that we specified before, uh, other custom annotations, uh, metadata. So this was the response of the function, or some custom metadata that we passed. Uh, in this case, there was no exception, but otherwise here you will see what was the kind of error that was thrown, uh, the stack trace of the error so that you can better go and troubleshoot uh, later on. And here we have the same service map as before. And then uh, if we go to see the logs, for instance, now I'm seeing an old log, but uh, if I go and refresh, I should see the log that I just uh, executed exactly. I have two executions. Uh, so if we go to the um, the oldest one, we will see it here. And this is what basically we were mentioning earlier. We see two kinds of logs. Uh, ones are the uh, are the ones uh, emitted by logger by the module logger. As you can see, they are already uh, stru structured as a JSON, so that later on you can easily uh, run queries and filter on them, and you don't have to parse them. Parse them, parse them really. And here, uh, as we were mentioning, we injected uh, a number of key values. They are basically the values that you will have in the context of your function. Again, uh, we log also if this function was a cold start, a uh, function that had a cold start or not, plus also log level, messaging, and so on. And this uh, with all the different logs that we emitted. And then we also have another kind of logs, which are the logs emitted by the metrics package. And this is in this use uses the EMF um, format that we were discussing earlier. So basically, we are emitted emitting those metrics uh, in the standard output that gets redirected to CloudWatch, so that later on CloudWatch metrics uh, can pick them up. And here is an example of the. The demo. My session like <laughs> always happens. I mean, I would that uh, it, would this be a demo if something wouldn't go wrong? <laughs> let's uh, let's be honest. <laughs> exactly. So just a second, I go back to the metrics. So here I have a bunch of metrics, and here, interesting. This gives me the chance to uh, highlight the fact that here we have the namespace that we set before in our functions. Uh, this was a CDK example. And here I have a, server, a, a series of metrics that were emitted in the logs. And without me doing anything, uh, basically, they ended up already uh, in, the, in the CloudWatch metrics section, where I can observe them, I can chart them, and I can mix them and match them to see uh, both, them, both here, but also I can create CloudWatch dashboards, for example. I can also set alarms in case I want to be notified of certain events, uh, both for metrics that were emitted or the lack of uh, some of those metrics. So Excellent. that's right. more or less it. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I yeah, they'd really like to see that. Just something that uh, Alpa Codes had a question, which um, you know, if you're working with single-purpose Lambda functions, uh, what are some use cases where you would get enough value from Power Tools, Log Trace Metrics over out-of-the-box observability tools, CloudWatch, and X-ray? Uh, I mean, my initial response is you're going to get value even if you've got a single uh, single Lambda function because. You are talking about a single Lambda function, but I'm sure Alpha codes that you have many Lambda functions. And so this helps to just standardize it across a whole bunch of things. And in order to get enough value from uh, the out-of-the-box observability tools, CloudWatch and X-Ray, these are using CloudWatch and X-Ray. So this is just removing all that setup 
I won't say hassle, but there's you know extra lines of setup code that you have to do to create everything correctly in CloudWatch, to create the whole embedded metrics format, to create the trace setup, all of that. So that that's what this is giving you. Just you're just importing some extra libraries that makes it much easier. Sarah, is that a is that a good uh, explanation? What else would you add? Excellent, Shevskis. <laughs> So yeah, Alpha Codes makes it much simpler. And if, I think also one of the things is if you if you just get used to adding, because um, also Lambda Power Tools is added as a Lambda layer. So you know it's really easy to add to a whole bunch of functions, and then you've just got that functionality uh, uh, that functionality uh, to use. So yeah, so Stephen did actually mention about the. Did you also mention it is a layer? So yeah, do we want to chat about how we actually so, add um, yeah. Power Tools to a, a function? So. Uh, uh, Yes, there is a lambda layer at the moment only for the Python runtime. So Python, if you're using Python Power Tools, yes, you will find a public layer and you can find the uh, errands of all the layers on several regions on the documentation. Uh, for Power Tools TypeScript specifically, we don't have a layer yet. It might be in the cards for the future, definitely after, not before. Uh, we reach GA. Uh, at the moment, if you want to use Power Tools, you will have to bundle it in your uh, function deployment package, like you do with all the other dependencies. You can just add it to your package JSON, download it from NPM, and from there, it's the same as the other dependencies. Yeah. So yeah, that's easy enough to easy enough to add in. Um, so there was another question which I've lost in my list. Um, Sorry, Tony, this was from earlier about, and this was just talking about where you were walking through the code and talking about the setup parts of it. And, you know, is this executed outside the Lambda handling? Would it be executed once on cold start and reused for consecutive execution? So yeah. how would we? So some of the, um, so when I was mentioning about the handler, I meant the handler function within your code base of your Lambda com base. And indeed, uh, whatever you put outside of the handler function, it is going to be uh, reused as well. So you can use it also for caching. So yeah, that's uh, definitely a behavior that we leverage as well. Yeah, and I suppose it's both. You're doing all the setup uh, outside of the handler, so that's you know creating the creating the loggings, the metrics, and the tracing, and then you are emitting those um, metrics and logs within the handler as the uh, as the function runs. Yes, exactly. So yeah, so just to just to recap, we've got you know Power Tools is uh, has metrics, logs, and tracing for uh, uh, Python. Java and in in beta public preview for for TypeScript, but you can also use it nicely uh, for JavaScript. And then I know the Python one does have a whole bunch of extra utilities, and these are things like uh, you know handling item potency, and I think reading from SQS uh, uh, batching, and a whole bunch of useful useful kind of things. So uh, yeah, I mean. It, in my opinion, it's a no-brainer to be looking at Power Tools, um, and I think it's only going to get better as AWS and the community is able to contribute and add some more. Yeah, exactly. And um, again, one of the things that I would like to add that I also mentioned at the beginning, um, we really would love to hear from you, and we will really to also love to hear um, uh, have your contribution in the future. So right now we are still polishing also the contributing section and make sure that the everybody, regardless of their backgrounds, the level of seniority or level of proficiency with Lambda functions or the TypeScript ecosystem in general, we will love the contribution of everybody in the future, at least uh, coming forward. So. Um, yeah, that um, if you if you want to contribute, if you have any feedback about the features or the libraries, please open an issue in the GitHub repository. Or uh, we have even as a, we even have a Slack channel that it's in described in the, the repository readme file, I think. So yeah, that's it. Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I, you know, just to reiterate, this is all entirely open source. And although a lot of the code has been written by some AWS people, there's a huge amount of code which has not been written by AWS people. So I really encourage you when 
you know, companies are releasing open source tools that sometimes there's a, you know, it's only the AWS is going to run and manage this, you know, this, this particular uh, tool is certainly not that case. And so, yes, we've just done TypeScript, which has had a whole bunch of involvement from a lot of people. Uh, there's a really well curated roadmap, which is on the site as well. So if you want to see what is coming up and have involvement in deciding uh, what tools and features uh, are going to be looked at. And yeah, definitely obviously requires work and um, fingers going madly on the keyboards for uh, various kind of uh, other languages. Somebody did ask about Ruby. You know, currently Ruby isn't a supported one. Um, so if you're super keen, I'm sure the, the rest of the community would be super happy. Uh, would be super happy to um, uh, to get something going if you can try something out. Okay, so it's not Ruby, but we might or might not have a .NET coming soon. Oh. So I would keep an eye open. Maybe it's a spoiler, oh, sneak but peek. I would keep I like an it. eye open. Yes. Um, okay, cool. And, yeah. So. Uh, Yep, just same, just same. Uh, just have a same. look at okay. the roadmap. Ah, there we go. So, yeah, we're not hiding everything. If you want to see the sneak peek at what's in the future, it's on the roadmap. Well, Sara and Andrea, I really appreciate you coming on Serverless Office Hours today and showing us the power of Lambda Power Tools with a uh, with a cool demo. Um, yeah, really, really cool to uh, get your insights. And thanks for answering all the questions as well. You're welcome. Thanks a lot for having us. It's really been pretty nice. And cool. yeah, looking forward to meet again. Cool. Uh, yeah, uh, that's super great. And yeah, just to just to finish it off, um, you know, the serverless patterns collection. I think uh, I checked today. Yeah, 153 templates. So uh, if you are building uh, are building code and you want to connect API Gateway to Lambda or Lambda to DynamoDB or this kind of thing, you know, more than 150 now templates where you can just literally copy code. So this is for CDK and for SAM. You know, this is really useful to be able to uh, really useful to be able to get um, uh, writing those snippets of code. And then next up next week is going to be super cool. We are actually covering Lambda again because there's lots of Lambda stuff going on. And uh, uh, the, as usual, the excellent Eric Johnson and Adam Wagner, who's a return guest, is coming back. And they're going to be talking about AWS Lambda filtering. So this is new functionality if you are um, uh, using Lambda to read off a stream. So this is DynamoDB streams, Kinesis streams. I believe it's MSK um, managed streaming for Kafka and self-hosted Kafka, uh, Kafka and SQS. I think you can actually do filtering at the Lambda function. So um, yeah, this is really cool. So uh, sorry, at the Lambda polar before it even gets to the Lambda function. So yeah, so this is really good functionality. Saves you loads of money, makes your Lambda functions way more efficient. So we'll be getting to uh, into all of that detail next week, which will be super cool. And of course, everything about serverless and AWS, the easiest place to go to is serverlessland.com. This has got you know a roll up of all the blogs. It's got videos. It's got learning paths. It's got events. It's got the serverless patterns as much as you can have on uh, on serverlessland.com. And yeah, we've got great plans to be adding even more information over this year. So yeah, that's a really good place to go. So again, Sarah and Andrea, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to see where uh, Power Tools goes uh, with a little birdie hint that something may be interesting for .NET coming out. And I'm, and I'm sure there's a lot more, uh, a lot more happening. So yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thanks and to thank you. you for thank you for watching. We'll be back same time, same place next week. Uh, bring us all your serverless questions, and we'd love to um, help you out and teach you more about serverless, and so you can have more fun uh, with what you're doing. So thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks.